So we'll, we've entitled this Tightrope Troubleshooting, or we'll probably say uh, more appropriately, what do I do now when we encounter these problems? And certainly we're going to see this. Um, we see it in the intraoperative area, we see it immediately postoperatively, and we see it at home when the dogs are at home. I mean, this is reality for any technique. And this is usually the situation where we think we're pretty comfortable, we think we've got everything handled, like riding this bowl. And then it starts usually after about your first 10 to 15 cases where maybe you start to skip steps and uh, then your ego gets hurt a little bit and you encounter these problems that we need to deal with. So we want to give you some ammunition and some ways to deal with those well today. Well, the first troubleshooting is really preventing problems. And we do have a whole video on this, so you can look at that one as well, too. But uh, these are some of the things that I would say in terms of preventing problems. This is things you can learn the easy way. Learn from my mistakes and other people's mistakes along the way. And uh, the first one I start out with is just client communication. Again, we really need to do a good job of explaining what Tightrope is all about, the parts of what we're going to do, their role, their engagement in the process. It's really critical. The little video clip you saw run there uh, a little minute is also really important. I think it's not done a lot, but preoperatively, we want to really say what is the current instability status? Check anterior cranial drawer, uh, check internal rotation as you saw in the video, and check range of motion because we want to say is the technique doing its job and is the technique causing problems? And we're not going to know that unless we know where we started. So we really want to get a good feel for where all of those um, parameters are before we do the procedure. And then technique-wise, we, we go over this with every presentation on Tyro, but really critical um, in terms of uh, preparation, antibiotics, strict aseptic technique, and all the things we can do to really minimize even the chance of infection so that we don't have to deal with it. We don't have to troubleshoot it on down the line. Similarly, uh, intraoperatively, want to do the same thing, adhere to the principles, adhere to the technique guide. So exposure, we need good exposure, don't skimp on that, you know, don't try to be a hero as they say. We need to see the whole area, make sure that we're getting things done well, um, palpate the anatomy, become uh, familiar with it, and all of the different technique tips that we've given you in other forms um, that you can access to make sure that we do that well, to get the good result that we know we can get. Um, really every single time with tightrope if we kind of uh, stick to those principles. So let's first talk about intraoperative troubleshooting. Once we've prepared, we've tried to prevent the problems that go along, and then we do see something happen. So that basically is one of two things intraoperatively. Either we can't get the stability that we're going after, so it's not um, doing its job for whatever reason, um, or kind of the opposite is maybe it's too stable or we're getting binding and range of motion. We can't get to full extension or we can't get into flexion. And so those are kind of obviously two opposite ends of the spectrum for intraoperative problems. Why does it happen? It's pretty much on us as a surgeon. Um, so if we've evaluated those and we're sure that we didn't have problems with them before, the stability factor and the range of motion, um, then it's probably what we've done with the tightrope. And the most common mistakes are inappropriate tunnel placement. And you see those listed here, and you see some radiographic examples of those. It's common. Um, again, it usually happens after you've done a few, and you know, maybe you're, you're not paying quite as good of attention to detail as you were before, but really misplaced tunnels. The femoral start site, it's really easy to get that too cranial and or too proximal. And you see that in the top example radiograph, where it's both too cranial and too proximal. It's not in our most isometric point, uh, like we see in the technique guide and the video. Um, and then the tibial start site is that we can see that too distal often or not in that extensor groove. And you see an example of that in the bottom side there. And again, it's pretty easy to do if we're just really not paying attention to detail. And that's going to cause a problem. So it's not then most isometric, which can cause one or both of those problems. Either it's not stable where it's going to bind range of motion because it's not most isometric. So that's the definition of that uh, situation. Our exit sites are less of a problem, but we can see that. And again, in the top image there uh, on the x-ray that you see, we see that problem as well, too. So the button in this situation, it was done with the, the femoral uh, button technique, femoral side button technique. Uh, it's really in the joint. And that's going to cause binding and problems with the quadriceps mechanism. And so you can see that there, and that's something that we obviously have to correct because that's going to cause the problems of binding 
irritation and potentially other problems on down the line. And then another one besides misplaced tunnels then is the button or the toggle not down to bone. And again, that's where exposure comes back into play. That's where attention to detail of the technique come back into play. And we really need to make sure that those occur because that will uh, cause us problems both intraoperatively and then even more so on down the line. So how do we prevent those problems? Following the technique. So we've got to find out where are our anatomic landmarks. That's the beauty of tightrope is that they're very consistent very reliable anatomical landmarks where we can put the tunnel in the right place every single time and then add to that the benefit of using guide wires first. So before we drill the big tunnel, we make sure our guide wires, those small holes, those guide wires are in the exact right place so that when we do, do drill the tunnel and make the bigger hole, then we're set and we're going to be happy with those results. So we just need to stick with that and again use those guide wires to make sure that we do things right on down the line. And then use the other tools that are available. Again, we have great technique videos, great technique guides. They have the tensioner system, that protocol that ensures us. I promise you, you can every single time you do tightrope, if you follow those, especially the tensioning technique, before you tie the knot, before you come off the table, you can know that things are in the right place. Because if you go through the tensioning technique, things are stable, they're not binding, the tensioner is not pistoning back and forth all the things that are in the video and the guide, then you know you're right. And you can uh, be very confident that your post-operative radiographs are going to look perfect and the doll is going to do well because you know it has to be correct based on following the rules. So if that's not happening for whatever reason, what do we need to do? Well, if it's too lax, you're not getting uh, stability intraoperatively, go back and check those start sites. That's probably going to be it nine times out of ten at least is that for whatever reason you've mispalpated, you just haven't gotten things right, um, they're in the wrong place, so you don't have the best isometry and you don't have stability. If it's not the start site location, then it may be the button and toggle down to bone. Some soft tissue interposing, the toggle not flipped right, um, your exposure isn't good enough. You need to find that, look at it, make sure it's absolutely 100% down to bone and that you can tension it and tighten it and tie it well. Um, make sure the, the fiber tape strands aren't binding on one another. That can happen too. As it comes down, because there are four strands coming across the area, one could have a loop in it and be being bound by the other one, and that may uh, cause instability on down the line. And then the bottom line is, if any of these are happening, just get over your ego and redo it if necessary. We all have these problems. I've done literally thousands of tight ropes, and this still can happen to me as well too. And so the bottom line is, make sure, check it, don't skip a step. Don't say, yeah, this one's right without checking it. And if there is a problem, redo it. You can then also, if it's a minor one and you really can't uh, troubleshoot it as well, or you think that correcting it may cause more of a problem, then you can augment it with a lateral suture technique. And that certainly is a good option that has worked well uh, many, many times. Um, if the buttons are not down on bone intraoperatively, so if that's the problem there, then again, this is one you're going to have to redo, even if it means getting another tightrope out and making sure that we get that done well. And then if you have the binding or lost range of motion, the troubleshooting for that is really there. It's still check the start sites because the isometry can cause that problem too. It can cause instability, but it can also cause binding. Check the tightrope path. Sometimes it's impinging on soft tissues, catching on soft tissues. Uh, another problem there, check the bone uh, uh, impingement. Check the button and toggle not being in the joint or not being across the patellar tendon or quadriceps muscles or quadriceps tendon group. And then again, redo it if necessary. It really is. That's the beauty of tightrope. You can solve these problems intraoperatively. It's much better to get over your ego intraoperatively than to go to radiology and have to really face the music there and then take the dog back, reprep it, redo everything, undo everything, redo everything, go from there. And then again, this is mandatory, so you have to assess these post-operatively. And again, if this is not looking right at the time, it's not going to get any better. So if things are not right radiographically, again, is a time where you just have to get over your ego and immediately take it back to the OR if there's a significant problem. If any of those things that we've just talked about as causes of our issues are there, we need to do that. So what about that? What about radiographically? So here's a good example of this. Even on this top one, you see this toggle is actually still in the tunnel. This uh, unfortunately can happen and it can be hard to identify intraoperatively. 
because it can act kind of like a mountain climber's uh, little hook and that even within the tunnel, sometimes it can catch effectively enough so you think it's perfect intraoperatively. It is stable. You do have good range of motion. Everything's tensioned down well, tied down well. Um, but the problem is this is going to creep over time and we're going to have a problem. So this is one where we see it postoperatively. Unfortunately, we just have to go back. We have to go back and redo that one. It's not going to hold up in the long term when that dog starts to use the leg, cycles it, all that kind of stuff. So if you see a toggle in the tunnel, as you see in this top view here, that's a problem that has to be fixed. And it really should be fixed right then and there. Um, if they're off the bone, uh, in this situation here, and uh, you know, with or without problems in location, then again, that's another one we need to say, how bad is it? So if your laxity of anterior drawer is more than four millimeters, five millimeters, six millimeters, um, or if the toggle or button are more than about two millimeters off the bone, um, then really you need to redo that right, right then and there. Um, that's gonna become a long-term problem. It is gonna creep, it is gonna pull through the soft tissues and we're gonna get instability and you're not gonna have the outcome that you're really looking for. So those are ones we really uh, need to do that. And then again, if the tunnel locations are very far off, that's a situation where you should do that. Again, you can either redo the tightrope, if you can do that effectively, probably first choice. If not, you can augment it with other techniques as needed. But again, just get over your ego and get, get it taken care of for the patient and the client at that time point. These are the easy ones here. So the minor complications um, that we see. Seroma, the main thing I would point out is actually don't be too aggressive. So the only times I've seen seroma get infected is when people do too much. What I mean by that is when they uh, tap it, when they stick a needle in there and cause a problem. If it's just a seroma, it's not draining, there's no signs of infection, just time and warm packing. So have the client do that, they can become engaged, they can solve the problem, which is a beautiful thing. I do usually extend the antibiotics and sometimes I'll switch to something like Clavamox um, for those time periods. And I do that if there's a minor incisional problem as well too. The other major key for both of these, seroma and incisional, is extend the e-collar until that's resolved because it can be an irritant and if the dog starts messing with it, that's the other time it is going to get infected. Even when it's not, it's a minor complication until problems occur either from us or the dog um, addressing that. So those can be very easy. Again, the important part about that is warning the owners. I warn the owners about 10% of these will get seroma. Um, if it happens, it's really not a big deal. We just need to monitor it, we need to warm pack it, we need to stay on top of it, and then we shouldn't have problems on down the line. Okay, then what about the post-operative long-term ones after they've been discharged at home and we see these problems uh, occur? And these are the ones that are, are um, more difficult to deal with and we really need to talk through. So pain and lameness. And a lot of times they've been doing well um, for a while. Certainly we can see where they never quite recover to, to the point we want. A lot of times these are ones that are actually doing the best and doing too well uh, early on. And then all of a sudden we have a lameness. Well, get them back in is the main thing. Look at the dog. Do a complete examination. I mean, that's really step one. It seems kind of crazy but uh, not to, but unfortunately it happens uh, a fair number of times. And then for sure, um, far and away, the number one cause of this published uh, data is the meniscus. So really look for meniscal click, pain on flexion of the knee, joint line tenderness. Those are all signs of a meniscal problem. And especially if you didn't do a meniscal release or it was someone else's case or um, you, know, you just did a partial meniscectomy that you weren't sure about. But especially if, if, if a full release was not done at the index surgery, I can almost guarantee you the meniscus is the problem. And so I would talk to them about that and we need to address that right away. The only way to address that is to take care of it um, surgically afterwards. Um, and then if it's not meniscus or you're still not sure about that, then we want to pursue further diagnostics. So radiographs would be the next step to look at the tunnels, the location of our implants to see what's going on there. And then through that, we want to differentiate between an infectious problem and an aseptic irritation implant problem. And those can look very similar, so it, it is sometimes hard to distinguish. Both of those problems, both aseptic uh, loosening or aseptic irritation and infection can have this tunnel widening. So we see this kind of widening of our tunnels on the radiographs. Going to be pain in that location, irritation. And then we have to distinguish between infection and an aseptic problem because that will influence what we do and the time frame we do it in. 
If it is infection, based on the dog's attitude and appetite, heat in the joint, a really severe lucency, a lot of swelling in the joint, uh, a joint tap, that shows presence of bacteria and neutrophils or a soft tissue aspirate that shows those things and we're sure it's infection, then we really need to take a direct path and communicate with the clients. If the joint is involved, if it is infection from the tightrope and the joint is involved, then we need to be really aggressive. That joint has to be flushed immediately. The implant has to come out. You need to get culture and sensitivity. We need to address that aggressively or we will lose that joint and the long-term outcome will be poor. We can salvage these joints if we're aggressive about it. So if it is in the joint, and again, that's based on effusion, uh, arthrocentesis with cytology, and other symptoms and physical exam findings that you may find, we have to be aggressive with that. If the joint is not involved or you're already past 8 to 12 weeks, preferably 12 weeks, um, then, you know, if the joint is not involved or you're past that time frame, then we can go ahead and get the implant out safely and really have a good outcome from that standpoint. So we want to do culture and sensitivity testing when we take that out, and we don't want to do then appropriate antibiotics based on that. If the joint is not involved but we're before 8 to 12 weeks, but you're sure the joint is not involved and we're, we're before 8 to 12 weeks after the tightrope procedure, then we'd like to manage it non-operatively until the 12 week point, okay? The reason for that is with careful monitoring, if we do that, then we should be able to use the periarticular fibrosis that's been formed during that 12 week period as our long-term stability for the joint. And that really works um, mo the majority of the time. So we can do that safely if the joint is not involved, and we would rather do that because then we're going to save them one or more surgical procedures afterwards. So if we can, we effectively manage that till 12 weeks, and then we would explant the tightrope, still do all the culture and sensitivity testing, but in that situation, we're easily able to take the tightrope out without having to do another stabilization procedure, which would be great. If you can't do that, of course, then we need to be aggressive, and we need to get the tightrope out right away because that will be or become the nidus of infection and cause real long-term problems. So if you do need to remove it, um, we can do that uh, pretty simply and effectively. The reasons we would explant the tightrope and remove it would be infection, uh, long-term irritation of the implant, and then unresolved lameness where we've taken, checked the meniscus, taken care of that. We just can't find another reason for it. It just may be the implant irritating soft tissues, irritating the bone, um, causing inflammation in some other form or fashion um, that really is causing the problem for the dog. So the way we want to do that is first localize the button and the toggle preoperatively. Um, there are several ways to do that. Um, I think uh, Dr. Bob Cook has come up with a really good way that can be done in every practice. If you have intraoperative fluoroscopy um, or other methods of imaging intraoperatively, of course you can do that, but most of us don't have that. And so what we can do is this technique that Bob's come up with, which is just to place a hypo sterile hypodermic needle through serial x-rays if you need to. So go in your x-ray suite, uh, place those needles until it's right on the toggle or the button, and then leave those there, prep around it, and then you can go exactly to the location of that intraoperatively. It will save you a ton of time and a ton of heartache and frustration, I promise you that. Um, so put both of those needles in, and then you're able to go right to that. Because what we'd like to do is remove the tightrope very minimally invasively from the medial side where the buttons and toggles are, which will save all the lateral periarticular fibrosis, which is the stabilizer of the knee. And so that's how we can take the tightrope out without having to do other stabilization procedures because the long-term biological stabilization would still be in place. So once that's done, then we'd like to make the medial incision over the toggle first go down to it, securely grasp it, usually with a wire driver uh, or a needle driver, needle holders, uh, and then hold on to that. And then we'd make the small medial incision over the button and the knot. Make sure we expose the button and the knot so that we can pull those all out without uh, leaving any part behind. Securely grasp those. We'd cut all four strands of the tightrope of the fiber tape underneath the button, pull out the button and all the knots, and then you can go back to the toggle and pull everything out. One little trick, especially if it's a more chronic one, it's been in long term and there is a lot of interdigitating fibrous tissue in there, is you can do what I call the crocodile roll. And that's to, instead of just trying to pull and yank that out, 
is just roll the fiber tape over your needle driver or whatever instrument you're using as that will give you some leverage and incrementally bring that out kind of like a winch system. And so that does um, really work very, very effectively. Just make sure you get it all out and then it really is mandatory um, and ethically most appropriate to go ahead, even if it's not infection, you should culture that implant and just make sure there's nothing underlying residual. And so that if we need to, we can use the most effective antibiotics for that as well too. Always ensure the meniscus status. We just know it's the most common cause of this. And then one thing you can do, especially if you're still a little bit worried about instability at that time point, is you can do uh, what's called a biceps femoris tendon transposition, which is basically a derivation of the lateral invocation. You can see one image of it here. Again, what we're going to do is just identify that band in the lateral fascia that is the biceps tendon. And we can isolate that and actually transpose that craniodistally to act as a dynamic stabilizer of the knee. And I found this very effective when I've had to remove tightrope either a little bit early or there's some remaining instability. This is a biological way, so we're not putting anything else into a potentially infectious situation to stabilize the knee long term. And a number of us have found that very, very effective and is an easy technique to do that can help a lot. And then you always would re imbricate as well with that and then rehab. I will tell you that um, certainly we've seen these. You saw the percentages and there's you know, um, cases that this is going to happen in. You will see some infection for whatever reason. Uh, we've talked about how that occurs and a lot of them we can't control, so you will see it. Um, and this is a really effective way to deal with it. You should be able to deal with it. And we really do still see the patients have a good long-term outcome, um, either with these biological augmentations or just really good rehab long-term. As long as the meniscus is addressed, we make sure the joint is taken care of right away and we do good follow-up and rehab, we really still see these patients have very good long-term outcomes. So infection is not the end of the world. It stinks, and I tell the clients that, and we have to deal with it, but it certainly is not the end of the world, and we can still see very good outcomes and high-level activity in these patients. So again, I'll just refer you to the tools that Arthrex has available. Check out the website. Again, all of these are very effective, and this is the only company that I know of that does it this way, and we certainly are available to help you troubleshoot as well, too. Thanks.